What if God was one of us? Matthew chapter 3, verses 13 to 17. It was one of those one-hit wonders, but we still hear it on the radio quite frequently. Recorded in the 90s by Joan Armstrong, it still remains unique and its lyrics challenge and shock us. What if God was one of us? Just a slob like one of us, just a stranger on the bus trying to make his way home. I don't know how you respond to those lyrics. They certainly are shocking, but they contain a very profound idea. What if God was one of us, just a slob like one of us? What an idea. And yet, way, way back, even before the creation of time, it seems, that someone in heaven may have had just the same idea. What if, God said to himself, what if? Now John the Baptist was having a bad day. Something inside him said that things weren't right. Something didn't fit. Something was out of place. This can be very frustrating, can't it? I don't know if any of you uh, saw the film A Girl with a Peer Pearl Earring. I recommend it if you haven't. It's not a fast-moving adventure, but the camera work and the artistry is incredible. Very much in keeping with its theme, which is about a painting of the same name by the 17th century master Vermeer. In it, the girl hardly says a word, but her actions and her expressions speak a thousand words. And early one morning, she's in the master's studio gazing at his painting, and you can tell that she sees that something is wrong. There is something that should not be there. And then suddenly she sees what it is. And the next scene has her huffing and puffing as she boldly, because she's been given strict instructions not to touch anything, she boldly moves the chair out of the frame. The next morning she looks again at the painting and the chair has been painted out. She was right, it should not have been there. It made the woman look trapped. And thanks to her intervention, the artists recognise that too. But enough about the movies. Here we find John in much the same position. Something does not look right. Oh, he'd easily seen it when it came to the Pharisees and the other hypocrites that he sent packing. But now? I know he was stood in the river, but I expect we might well have found John doing a few goldfish impressions at this moment, mouth popped open in confusion and surprise. Something definitely did not look right about this, and John tried to move things around. Well, ask yourself, if you were in his sandals, wouldn't you do the same? And behind all his protesting lay one very bemusing question. What do you want to go and do this for? I mean, you, Jesus, why do you want to go and be baptised? Didn't make sense, did it? It seems so unnecessary, so out of place, and many people since have echoed John the Baptist's question. Why was it that Jesus was baptised? Why? Now this is not just a, a fun question from Trivial Pursuit or something like that. It is uh, really confusing and in some ways it's a very troubling question. Why, after all, were people flooding to John to be baptised? The answer to that is straightforward. It was to be baptised for the forgiveness of their sins. It was to make a, a public act of repentance. It was to turn from their sins and seek again the God that they had abandoned. So why was Jesus baptised? To repent of his sins? But what sins? If Jesus is everything we believe him to be, then surely there was no dirt that needed washing off him. He needed no cleansing bath. If you've not thought about it before, 
then surely you can see now the reason for John's hesitation and for many people's confusion. If baptism is for the forgiveness of sins, then Jesus, the sinless one, the one who had no sin but was the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, he surely had no need of baptism. So why was he baptised? Well, one early writer, struggling with the question, came up with an ingenious answer. It was because his mother told him to. That's true. Well, at least according to the Gospel, according to the Hebrews, one of the books which, surprise, surprise, did not make it into the New Testament. The book clearly states that Jesus protested the irrelevance of his baptism, but nevertheless gave into the pressure from his mother and brothers, and he did it anyway. Now we know from the true Gospels that Jesus knew well enough how to resist the pressure of his mother and brothers. And we also know that this was not the reason he was baptised. Jesus was not baptised because his mother said so, but because his father said so, his heavenly father. Now, let it be known so for now, he said, for this is how we shall do all that God requires. His baptism was firstly an act of obedience, of submission to the will of the Father. In some ways we might say it was unnecessary and certainly confusing, but it is what the Father required and so Jesus would do it. Jesus would obey. And this presents the first challenge to us. Jesus' ministry began with an act of obedience. And it continued as he walked the path of obedience all the way to death on the cross. In some ways for himself, what Jesus did was unnecessary, odd and bewildering. But he still walked that path, not for his own need, but for you and me. And for the sake of the will of God. The next time the challenge comes to us, And we're tempted to bypass it because we believe we can get on very well ourselves without all the bother. Perhaps we should stop and think again. The challenge of obedience may sometimes seem petty and unnecessary, inconvenient and sometimes a right pain. But remember that as Jesus' ministry began in obedience, so does ours. As Jesus' mother did actually say, whatever he says to you, do it. Now, I have to confess that sometimes I'm sceptical and sometimes I'm really jealous of those whose faith is so simple that they can drop everything and go off and do all kinds of things without a second thought. Why? Because God said to do it, so I did it. Personally, while I have often done it eventually, I find things harder than that. And I suspect I may not be alone. Of course, there is no getting away from the fact that our journey of faith will sometimes, if not often, require us to make sacrifices, to do things that we would rather not, to go places we would rather not go, and to obey even when we really do not want to. But many of us often need more than blind obedience. We need to understand things for ourselves. We need things to make sense. And God, I think, understands that. He made us, after all, as thinking and reasoning people. It was not wrong of John to seriously question what Jesus was doing. It's not wrong of us to ask our questions either. So why was Jesus baptised? Some of us may think it's enough to say that he was obedient, but others will want to know more. Why was it the will of God? And the scriptures do give us a second and deeper and fuller answer to our question. The answer framed this time not in terms of obedience to God, but in terms of identification with humanity. What if God was one of us, just a slob like one of us? What if? Among the crowd flocking to John for baptism, as Luke tells us, were corrupt soldiers 
tax collectors, outcasts and sinners. There were those who needed to repent and who knew it. There were those who needed to repent and everybody knew it. And surrounded by the likes of these, Jesus went down into the water of baptism. A very public act of solidarity, of identification, of God reaching out to those in need. Of course, there are many who would shy away from being identified with people like that. Remember the story of the Pharisee and the tax collector? Thank God, I'm not like him. It's quite distasteful, really, isn't it? Yet how often do we want to keep standards and find it hard to be gracious to others who don't keep those standards? How often can we feel superior? How often do we fear being tarred with the same brush? A long time ago, when Inspector Taggart was still in Taggart, the good old Glaswegian got himself caught up in a bit of a conundrum. Having agreed to be the godparent for a baby, he later discovered that by doing so, he'd linked himself with the name of a mass murderer. What could he do? Don't worry, sir, his young assistant told him. It won't ruin you. It'll simply establish your street cred. Now, it's not surprising that Inspector Taggart shrank away from the associations that may have been damaging to him. It is surprising, perhaps, that Jesus did not. In his baptism, his street cred was established. In the River Jordan, he reaffirmed that God was one of us, just a slob, a real human being, just like one of us. It was a policy, God's policy, which had him marked out insultingly as a friend of sinners and which ultimately led to his death, surrounded by criminals. But that didn't bother him in the least, for that is what he came to do. And there is indeed a great irony in their insults, for Jesus was and Jesus is the friend of sinners. John rightly described him elsewhere as the Lamb of God, who offered himself as a sacrifice to take away the sin of the world. He was someone who came to live as one of us and who identified himself closely with us, even in a criminal's death on the cross, so that we might be identified with him in his resurrection and new life. The scriptures describe this as having union with Christ or being one with him. And the identification is complete. If we die with Christ, said Paul, so we shall also rise with him. So there follow two challenges. Firstly, to turn to Christ. As John called us to repent and know the kingdom of God is at hand. It is to identify ourselves fully with Christ and his life and death and resurrection and so to receive his forgiveness and love. It is to die to sin and to rise up to new life in Christ, a symbol of all that baptism means and enables for us. The second challenge is in Christ's name to turn in love to others. And this is no small thing because the question of our street cred is raised. And that requires us to step out and build trust with those we may not yet have much to do with. Those we may not even want at the moment to have much to do with. But those who we know that God loves and who we know he wants us to love. Doesn't allow for any comfortable sofa surfing like church it requires us to be up and out there and at it there are hearts and there are souls to win and do we doubt that this is God's call that this is what God wants of us and think about this 
It was only when Jesus went and jumped in the river that the heavens opened and the Father's voice declared, that's my boy. It was when Jesus got wet and dirty and up to his neck in the same water as all the people around him that God said, yes, and expressed his approval so clearly. Maybe that voice of heaven was uh, not so much a message for Jesus, but for us. The not so subliminal message being that this is the kind of thing that thrills God's heart and makes him proud of his children. What if God was one of us, just a slob like one of us, just a stranger on the bus finding his way home? Well, what if? And what if we really got out there and took what we hold so special here on a Sunday out into the real world, among real people on the bus, down our street, in the choir, the club, the school, the pub? If we didn't shy away or hide away from the stranger, but instead encountered God there, so that we and they discover that God is indeed drawing near. What if? What if?